What I want to talk about today are some aspects of codes and code breaking which might not be familiar to you. Um, codes, of course, seem to uh, exert an extraordinary fascination upon people of all sorts. I just collected a few illustrations here which are much in the news. I mean, of course, the Da Vinci Code um, made somebody a lot of money. Uh, when it came out, I had an idea that I really should have followed through on was to follow up with a novel called The Highway Code, <laughs> which, um, which would be about a, a sequence of uh, sinister signs that would appear all over the country that would eventually lead you to some grand secret down at the uh, vehicle licensing offices in Swansea. Um, and it would serve them right if they had hundreds of thousands of people converging on them for <laughs> tours of their premises. So you, you can see that the whole idea of, uh, of, uh, of codes uh, has become some sort of iconic symbol of uh, attention and uh, sinister conspiracy. Most of us have an encounter with codes. If you live in Cambridge on a daily basis, your main uh, code challenge will be something like this. And to get a feel for sort of some of the numbers that we're going to look at in other circumstances, suppose you have a bike lock that's got a four-digit code. How many combinations are you looking at? Uh, if it's zero to nine, you've got ten options on each. So there's ten times ten times ten times ten. Ten thousand uh, possible combinations. If you were to search through all those combinations at a rate of one a second, uh, you're looking at about two and three quarter hours to try them all. So on the average, you might expect to break this code in about half of that time. If you want to be doubly secure, you could put two of these <laughs> locks, one on the front wheel and one on the back. But I did find this picture <laughs> recently. Well, more sophisticated codes uh, of the sort that are used for diplomatic and military purposes have a different type of structure. They're usually based upon the creation of an operation uh, in which you encrypt a message, and that operation has a particular property that sometimes mathematicians call a trapdoor function or a trapdoor operation. A trapdoor in your ceiling uh, like this illustration, has a rather simple property. It's very easy to fall through it in one direction uh, and quite difficult to clamber back in the other direction. And this is what you want for an encoding operation. It should be relatively simple to encrypt and encode your message, but difficult uh, to go back in the opposite direction. So the sort of mathematical operations uh, which have this property uh, there are lots of them, it's very common. I mean, suppose your message was uh, x and you took uh, uh, the inverse cosine of x and then raised it to the power 1.3 and then subjected it to taking its logarithm and then take the Bessel function value of that answer. You've got a horribly complicated operation to invert and go backwards, but it's relatively simple for a calculator or a computer to go in one direction. But most uh, significant codes, the sorts that's used to make your credit card information secure on Amazon or other shopping sites, uh, is based around an operation that's really seemingly rather simple. It takes two enormous prime numbers, multiplies them together to make uh, an even bigger composite number. This is something in principle that a, a computer or a calculator can do uh, in a tiny fraction of a second. But to factorize a given composite number into its two prime factors, if this number is 50 or 100 digits long, uh, is something that could take the fastest computer on Earth thousands of years to accomplish. So the point of these type of commercial codes is that they're not unbreakable in principle, but they're unbreakable in practice. They require too much processing time in order for the inverse operation to be completed. If somebody in the world of pure mathematics were today to discover some new algorithm, uh, some new property of prime numbers, which would allow large composites to be decomposed into their prime factors 
very, very quickly, uh, the world would be in serious crisis uh, if this was made known, perhaps even bigger crisis if it wasn't made known but surreptitiously used. Uh, because all the world's diplomatic and military and commercial codes would be compromised. Well, we don't think that's happened, uh, but on the other hand, would we know? It was a, a British uh, number theorist, uh, Cox, who discovered this type of encryption process. There are other ingredients to it, the more sophisticated ingredients, uh, a long time ago, I think in the early 70s. And uh, he was working for GCHQ at the time, and there's a great story about his discovery of this simple uh, process. Uh, he'd left the doors of GCHQ uh, one evening after work, and the rules are you're not allowed to talk about, write down, or in any other way record anything you think about uh, code breaking and codes while you're off their premises. So when he got home to his digs, he had this idea uh, of a new type of uh, encryption process. And he was so excited about it, but he knew he couldn't write anything down about it. He wasn't allowed to do that. And he didn't want to go to sleep because he thought, you know, like many of us always worry, you go to sleep, you wake up in the morning and you can't remember it anymore. So he stayed awake all night uh, and left at one minute to six to get to the gates of GCHQ the moment they opened and then wrote down uh, his new procedure. It was kept secret. Uh, many, many years later, it was dis discovered again by Israeli uh, mathematicians uh, and publicized. But had it been um, uh, patented, as it were, at that time by GCHQ, uh, the UK would have had a worldwide patent on all encryption processes, uh, all credit card encryption operations. So this is uh, an area where pure mathematics in its purest sense, number theory, uh, is very much part and parcel of the everyday world. But I'm not in this lecture going to talk about that type of uh, high-level uh, code-making and code-breaking. I may return to it in another lecture. Uh, I want to talk about something that's seemingly much more mundane. And it's the use of what we might call codes uh, for identifying people and places and guaranteeing the integrity of particular transactions and operations against simple errors, mistakes, as well as sort of invasion uh, for people with uh, nefarious aims.